Thank you very much. It was just uh, announced by Attorney General Barr that they've caught the killer of legend to Pharaoh. Uh, horribly shot young man, wonderful young man. And uh, we have uh, just uh, — this just came out two minutes ago. So Attorney General Barr just announced, as you know, we named uh, Operation Legend after Legend DeFaro, where we're going to be helping out and are in the process of helping out cities throughout our country that have difficulty with crime, in particular certain types of crime. So that's really good news. They caught the killer of legend. Today, we saw Joe Biden continue to politicize a pandemic and to show his appalling lack of respect for the American people. That's what it is. At every turn, Biden has been wrong about the virus, ignoring the scientific evidence and putting left-wing politics before facts and evidence. Sleepy Joe opposed both the China and the Europe travel bans. You know that. He opposed the China travel ban that I instituted very early and the Europe travel ban that I instituted quite early. If he had followed, if we went after uh, and listened to his advice, hundreds of thousands more people would have died. This is according to many people. I believe that uh, Dr. Fauci agreed with that. He said that uh, President Trump made a great decision when he put the ban on China. Joe Biden wants to fling open American borders, allowing the pandemic to infiltrate every U.S. community based on his policies. He uh, wants to have ridiculous open borders. I've been saying from the first day I started campaigning for this great office that uh, you have open borders, you don't have a country. You don't have a country with open borders. So he wants open borders. The Democrats want open borders. And if you take a look at our southern border, we would have criminals pouring through. The wall is getting close to 290 miles long, and it's having a huge impact. So we disagree with him on that. That's one of the many different — many things that we disagree with. But while Joe Biden would allow rioters and looters and criminals and millions of illegal aliens to roam free in our country. He wants the federal government to issue a sweeping new mandate to law-abiding citizens. He wants the President of the United States, with the mere stroke of a pen, to order over 300 million American citizens to wear a mask for a minimum of three straight months. I guess this just happened. He thinks it's good politics, I guess no matter where they live and no matter their surroundings, because different states are much different, both in terms of the atmosphere itself and also in terms of uh, the corona problem. He does not identify what authority the President has to issue such a mandate or how federal law enforcement could possibly enforce it or why we would be stepping on governors throughout our country, many of whom have done a very good job, and they know what is needed. Also, many of our 50 states are doing the uh, the job at a level that, frankly, people are really surprised, uh, including foreign governments that are calling us constantly and asking for advice. So I want to just say our governors have uh, worked very hard. Uh, they've worked with Vice President Pence and myself and everybody else that's been uh, going. We have uh, Scott now involved. And so, Scott, congratulations. But you'll be working with a lot of governors. You've already started. And Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birx. If the President has the unilateral power to order every single citizen to cover their face in nearly all instances, what other powers does he have? That's why he refused Biden to take questions. He couldn't answer any of them. Couldn't answer the questions. He refuses to take questions. He never takes questions. I take questions. He never takes questions. And you sort of wonder what's going on, because they're not that difficult. 
Some can be nasty, but they're not that difficult. But he never takes questions, so he just, I guess, left. I didn't see it, but I guess he just left the podium. Put it in your minds. My administration has a different approach. We have urged Americans to wear masks. And I emphasized uh, this is a patriotic thing to do. Maybe they're great, and maybe they're just good. Maybe they're not so good. But frankly, uh, what do you have to lose? You have nothing to lose. So we do, and we've uh, been saying wear them when it's appropriate, especially in terms of social distancing, if you can't distance enough. And uh, what do you have to lose? But again, it's up to the governors, and uh, we want to have a certain freedom. And we want to have a certain freedom. That's what we're about. At the same time, we also understand that each state is different and is facing unique circumstances. You have very, very different states fa facing very unique differences and circumstances. We've entrusted the governors of each state, elected by the people, to develop and enforce their own mask policies and other policies, following guidance from the federal government and CDC. We're working with each state to implement a plan based on the facts and science. We will continue to urge Americans to wear masks when they cannot socially distance, but we do not need to bring the full weight of the federal government down on law-abiding Americans to accomplish this goal. Americans must have their freedoms, and I trust the American people and their governors very much. I trust the American people, and the governors want to do the right thing to make the smart decisions. And uh, Joe doesn't. Joe doesn't. Joe doesn't know too much. Unlike the Biden approach, our approach is guided by science. That's why we're focused on protecting the high-risk Americans. That is why we're delivering effective medical treatments to dramatically reduce the fatality rate. And that is why we're developing a vaccine and therapeutics in record time. You'll see that, I think, very soon. Sleepy Joe rejects the scientific approach in favor of locking all Americans in their basements for months on end, which I think is something that Scott would be very opposed to. I think I can speak for you. We've been dealing pretty strongly over the last number of weeks. But he wants them uh, in the basement for months on end. And you have governors that have been very, very strict on keeping people in their houses, keeping people in their uh, — wherever they may be, apartments. And frankly, uh, I don't think the results are necessarily better than other results. But he wants to shut down our economy, close our schools, and grind society to a halt. And he wants it done by a federal decree. This would lead to a crippling, long, long-lasting depression. This would be a crippling, long-lasting depression. And yesterday, I showed you the numbers about how well we're doing coming back with auto sales and auto manufacturing and used car sales and housing sales at, at numbers that nobody would have believed. And we're back and very strong. It's a very strong V. It's almost a Straight up V, we'll be discussing that over the next couple of days. But the economy is coming back, and the employment numbers over the last three months are a record in history of our country. And we'll be back next year. I think we'll be uh, maybe even stronger than the previous year, where we set every record in the book on employment and stock market. By the way, our stock market numbers are very close to record, and NASDAQ is actually record over the last 14 days, 14 for 14 times now. It's been record. And that's uh, during what we hope will be the more final stages of the pandemic. So if we did what Biden wanted to do, it would shut down our health care system and lead to a massive increase in mortality, including suicide, overdose, heart disease, and countless other physical and mental harms. It is uh, very, very bad on the other side of the equation when you do something like that. Those shutdowns are very punitive, very punitive. They hurt a lot of people in a lot of different ways, through depression, through suicide, through so many other things, um, alcohol, drugs. Biden's approach is regressive. It's anti-scientific. And 
It's very defeatist, but it'd be very bad for our country. While Joe Biden has been playing politics from the sidelines, he has no clue. We've been solving problems and delivering tremendous results. The most advanced and robust testing system on the planet, the number one producer of ventilators in the world by far, unprecedented industrial mobilization, biggest since World War II, Operation Warp Speed to deliver life-saving treatments and very soon a vaccine. What a plan by Joe Biden has actually laid out would do, we've really already accomplished. In fact, many of the things that was well reported over the last few days, every single thing he said to do, every single thing we did, and we did them well. So Biden has no idea on his own. He only knows uh, what he thinks we should do, and he spews it out, and then he — I guess you could say he plagiarizes, and he really did in our case, because every single one of the events — I think, Kayla, we can say that — was uh, something we had already done. So we'll defeat the virus, but not by hiding in our basements. He's got to come out of his basement. We'll defeat this virus through a common-sense mitigation effort, shielding those at highest risk and unleashing America's medical and scientific genius, which is what it is. And we've already been doing it, and we're very close to having something that's going to be very, very special in the form of therapeutics and vaccines. To Joe, I would say stop playing politics with the virus too serious. Partisan politics is no place here. It's a shameful situation for anybody to try and score political points while we're working to save lives and defeat the pandemic. In times of national challenge, America's and Americans — and we are — by the way, we are working with countries from all over the world, and they're trying to learn from us. And some of the countries that you spoke most well about are having a tremendous surge right now. But it'll work out. But Americans must unite together, and they must put politics aside and have to really unite for a common good. Three vaccines are in the final stage of clinical trials. They're doing really well. We're producing the most promising vaccine candidates in advance. As you know, part of the largest industrialization ever. It's uh, incredible when I meet with heads of companies that are doing this, that are the best companies anywhere in the world. Uh, it's incredible where they are, how they're doing, and the speed with which they're doing it, and also the speed with which the FDA is approving things. Because by any other standard, you would have been two or three years away from being at the point that we're at. By the end of this week, we will have shipped 1,846 rapid point-of-care testing devices to nursing homes, which are a very important source, as you know, for people that are not handling the plague from China very well. This week alone, we're sending 992 testing devices and 450,000 tests to more than 950 nursing homes across the country. And these uh, tests are uh, incredible. These are tests that are all new, very modern. And we're also getting on the, the tests that are not uh, done immediately with the 5 to 15-minute timing. When they do send them to a lab, they're coming back now in three days. So it's a three-day process, which is about as good as you can do. You have one day of delivering, one day of receiving, and one day in the lab. We're also requiring all nursing homes to test all members of their staff at least weekly. By unleashing America's scientific genius, we have delivered effective treatments. The case fatality rate for Americans over 70 has declined by about 85 percent. That's a fantastic number. It's declined. That's case fatality. It's uh, declined by 85 percent. Europe has seen 40 percent more excess mortality than the United States compared to a non-pandemic year. So uh, you hear the numbers, and those numbers are very interesting, but that's the way it is. We continue to urge all Americans to wash your hands, socially distance, wear a mask when necessary and when you cannot distance and protect 
Very importantly, the vulnerable protect people that are older and especially people that have problems with heart or diabetes or some other problem. Earlier today, very exciting news, very big news all over the world. They're talking about it all over the world. It was amazing. We finalized a historic peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. After half a century, Israel and the United Arab Emirates will fully normalize their diplomatic relations. Nobody thought this was something that could happen for a long time. This is the most important diplomatic breakthrough since the Egypt-Israel peace agreement was signed over 40 years ago. We have Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, here. Thank you, David, for being here. We very much uh, — you would agree that this was a big day for Israel and a big day for the world. Good. Thank you, David. You've been fantastic, too. Fantastic ambassador and representative of our country. Thank you very much. The deal that was reached today will enable Muslims to have far greater ability to visit many historic sites in Israel and to peacefully pray at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is very important to them, which they've wanted to have access to for many, many decades. This is a monumental step to forging ties of cooperation in the Middle East, and I think you're going to have other countries come forward. I can tell you we already do, and they want to make a deal. You could have peace in the Middle East. It would be fantastic. Israel is also suspending settlements in the West Bank, which is a big deal, a bold step toward achieving peace. Israel and the United Arab Emirates have also agreed to immediately expand and accelerate scientific collaboration to develop effective treatments and vaccines to defeat the China virus. They've both been hit. Virtually every country has been hit, 188 countries, and to save lives in their region and in their world. So they are working very much on the uh, vaccines also with us. And uh, again, some very good news is going to take place with respect to that. Our unprecedented diplomatic engagements laid the groundwork for this historic peace agreement, which was just announced a little while ago today. We will not rest as we continue to work toward a world of greater harmony and prosperity for all. I want to thank Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed of the United Arab Emirates, two fantastic people for their vision and their leadership. And I look forward to hosting them at the White House very soon to formally sign the agreement. We'll probably be doing it over the next, I would say, three weeks and they'll be coming to Washington. So that was a tremendous day. That was a tremendous thing that happened. And uh, it's a great sign. We have a lot of other interesting things going on with other nations also having to do with peace agreements. And uh, a lot of big news is coming over the next few weeks. And I'm sure you'll be very impressed. And more importantly, it's a great thing for our country, a great thing for the world. So thank you very much. Please, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate it. I'm going to ask you about school-age kids and food. One of the real problems when you shut down the schools, these are kids on reduced and free lunch programs. They need these meals to make it through their day. And with districts shutting down school, what, if anything, can the federal government do to make sure that the kids still get decent meals as long as the schools are out? Well, you know, we don't want the schools shut down. We want the schools to open. And uh, especially very young children handle it, all children, all children, but especially very young children handle it very well. So we want schools open. We don't want to be in that position. We want schools open. Uh, we've made payment, and we would, frankly, if the school isn't going to open, we would much rather follow the child with the payment, give the money to the child, meaning the parents of the child, and let that uh, let the parents do what they have to do, including bringing the child to another school, because we're finding that whether it's uh, parents or children, people want to get back to school. They want to have their life back. Some people say they don't want the Democrats don't want schools open because that's where you have a lot of polling booths. And if you have a school closed, you can't very easily have polling booths at the school. And that's becoming I think uh, maybe we'll be able to show that as fact, but 
that's another thing that they're doing to try and keep people away from the polls. So we have to look into that. But it's uh, — you've been reading about it, I've been reading about it, and I don't like it. But we'd like to see the schools open. Then we don't have that problem. Good question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Mr. President, what's your understanding of how long Israel will suspend this West Bank <coughs> annexation plan? Uh, what do you think? Tell me. Um, we have uh, — we're putting all our eggs into the basket of peace. We have an agreement with the Emirates. We're going to nail down all the details, embassies, overflights, commercial. Then we're going to extrapolate that to the rest of the region. How long that takes, uh, I, I can't tell you. But that's — we've prioritized uh, peace over the sovereignty movement. Uh, but it's not off the table. It's just something that will be deferred until the uh, — we give peace every single chance. And, and what do you want the Palestinians to take away from this deal, since they're not really a party to it? Well, but they are supported largely by some of the countries that we're talking to and that have already signed, you know, in the case of the one country, but others will be following. And uh, I think the Palestinians will, without saying it necessarily yet, I think they very much want to be a part of what we're doing. And I see, ultimately, the Palestinians — I see peace between Israel and the Palestinians. I, I see that happening. I think as these very big, powerful, wealthy countries come in, I think the Palestinians will follow quite naturally. Yeah, please. Uh, do you believe that a deal could have been reached without Israel's agreement to temporarily uh, — to temporarily suspend uh, annexation? Say it again. Could you make it louder? Do you believe that a deal could have been reached without Israel's agreement to temporarily suspend annexation? What do you think about that, David? It's interesting. I think you can't do both at the same time. So I think, again, prioritize peace, sovereignty uh, after peace is given every opportunity to turn to sovereignty. I don't think the two could have been done at the same time. And have you asked Israel to permanently consider uh, abandoning annexation? No, this is, this is a temporary process. There's been no request. Okay. Please, Caitlin. Mr. President, this morning you said that you do not want to fund the U.S. Postal Service because Democrats are trying to expand voting by mail. So I've got two questions for you. One, are you threatening to veto any legislation that includes funding for the post, post office? No, not at all. No. So you would sign something that does include sure. funding? It's a separate thing. I would do it. But one of the reasons the post office needs that much money is to have all of these millions of ballots coming in from nowhere, and nobody knows from where and where they're going. You saw what happened in uh, Caitlin in Virginia. It was, uh, you know, 500,000 applications coming in, going all over the state. Nobody even knows where they came from. You saw what happened in New York, which was a disaster with Congresswoman uh, Carolyn Maloney. It was a — it was a basic disaster. And you see Patterson, New Jersey, what's going on there. And we can give you many other locations and sites. What has happened is that's part of a big negotiation. That's a actually small part of a big negotiation, to get more money to people that it wasn't their fault. It was China's fault. And post office is part of it. Another part of it is they want $3.5 billion just for the ballots themselves. Why it's so much, I don't know. But that's what the Democrats want. But if the bill isn't going to get done, that would mean the post office isn't going to get funded. And that would also mean that the three and a half billion dollars isn't going to be taken care of. So I don't know how you could possibly use these ballots, these mail-in ballots. Absentee ballots, by the way, are fine. But the universal mail-ins that are just sent all over the place, where people can grab them and grab stacks of them and sign them and do whatever you want, that's the thing we're against. That's precisely the problem, is that you're saying you do not want to give this post office funding in this coronavirus legislation. They say they need it so they can be prepared. So if the pandemic is still going on in November when the election happens and people don't feel safe to go vote in person, they can vote by mail and it can be safe and it can be secure. I can understand the post office. And if we could agree to a bill, the overall bill, which is obviously a much bigger number than just the post office, that would be fine. But they have the post office as one of their requests. It's their request. Right, but this morning you said you were against it, didn't you? I'm only against — what I'm against is I'm against doing anything where the people aren't taken care of, and the people aren't being taken care of properly. We have — we want people to get money. It wasn't their fault that they got shut down. They got shut down by China. So whether it's the post office or whether it's the three and a half 
billion dollars. You know, they're asking for three and a half billion dollars just for the universal mail-in ballots, but they're not willing to make a deal. These are two points within a very big deal. The thing they want more than anything else, Caitlin, and you know this, is bailout money for the states and for the cities that are in trouble, which, for the most part, are Democrat-run states and cities. So New York has a problem, California has a problem, uh, Illinois has a tremendous problem, and others. They want to be able to bail out these states, and we don't want to be doing that, or certainly don't want to do it to the extent they're looking for $1 trillion we don't want to be doing that. Please, morning, go ahead. I'm just really confused, because this morning you said they need that money in order to make the post office work so it can take all these millions and millions of ballots, and you said that would be fraudulent. So it sounded like well, you no, said no, you're blocking. No, no, I said it will end up being fraudulent, because if you look at what's happened over the last few weeks, just look at the few instances where this has happened, no it's turned out to be fraudulent. Fraud. Well, if you look at New York, it was fraudulent. If you look at Patterson, New Jersey, it was fraudulent. Of course there is. The, the whole thing is a mess. In fact, Carolyn Maloney's opponent is, he's gone crazed. He said they took the election away from him, and he may be right. I think they should redo that election. And if you look at Virginia, it's terrible. Look at some of the things that have happened in California. Look at California, where they found a million non-eligible voters. That was done by Judicial Watch, Tom Fitton and Judicial Watch. We have to have an honest election. And if it's not going to be an honest election, I guess people have to sit down and think really long and hard about it. But if the post office, if they're not going to approve a bill, and the post office therefore won't have the money, and if they're not going to approve a big bill, a bigger bill, and they're not going to have the three and a half billion dollars for the universal mail-in votes, how can you have those votes? What would mean is the people will have to go to the polls and vote. like. The old days, like two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, they have to go to the — it doesn't say anybody's taking the vote away, but it means that the universal mail-ins don't work. Absentees do work. It's a very different thing. An absentee, where you make an application and you send it in, they send you a vote, it's different. But — so, Caitlin, I'm not saying anything wrong with voting. I want them to vote. But that would mean that they'd have to go to a voting booth like they used to, and vote. Even if they don't feel safe voting in person? People want to vote by mail because... Well, they're, they're going to have to feel safe, and they will be safe, and we will make sure that they're safe. And we're not going to have to spend three and a half billion dollars to do it. And when you go to a voting, it would be wonderful if we had voting ID, and some states have that, and some states don't, because they can't get it passed. Most states want it. But we want people to vote, but we want people to vote so when they vote, it means one vote. It doesn't mean ballots all over the place. You saw what would, what was happening in Virginia, where piles of ballot applications are dropped all over the state. They had them named after dogs. They had them named after dead people. We want to have an accurate vote. I'm not doing this for any reason. Maybe the other turns out to be my advantage. I don't know. I can't tell you that. But I do know this. I just want an accurate vote. And it's a fair question, by the way. So does everybody else. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Mr. President. Mr. President, how does the uh, accord today between Israel and the UAE uh, help struggling and persecuted Christians in the Middle East? Help what? How, how does it help struggling and persecuted Christians in the Middle East, the deal today? Well, I think it's going to. I think it's a big start. And uh, you're right about that. Christians have been persecuted by some countries in particular in the Middle East. And I think this is a big start. It's going to be a very strong start, very powerful start. And it's something that I will tell you, I've told David and I've told every one of our negotiators, if you look at the way Christians have been treated in some countries, it's, it's beyond disgraceful. It's, uh, if, I, if I had information and if I had absolute proof some of the stories that we've heard, which are not easy, which is not easy to get, I would go in and do a number to those countries like you wouldn't believe what they do to Christians in the Middle East. And it's, it's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. You're right. It's a very big part of the overall negotiation. And as countries come in, for instance, UAE has agreed very strongly to uh, represent us, I think they will, very well with respect to uh, Christianity because in the Middle East, it's not treated well. It's not treated well at all. It's treated horribly and very unfairly, and uh, it's criminal what's happened.
And that's for many, many years. I think it's a great question and very un it's a very unfair situation. Please, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Larry Kudlow said that there's a routine check-in call with uh, China on the phase one trade deal. My question is, what if they bring up TikTok and, and also WeChat? Would you, engage, would you instruct your team to engage them on that executive no, we have a deadline of September 15th. And whether it's Microsoft, I understand, and others are negotiating. We also said that, obviously, it's worthless if we don't allow them into the country. So we said that the United States Treasury is going to be getting something out of this deal, something very substantial. But what we want is total security. But we have a deadline of September 15th. So I know Microsoft and others are very interested in it. But uh, that's our deadline. And it has to be proven to be totally secure. We don't want to have any information going into China with what we've been through. And I have to tell you, you talked about the deal. You mentioned uh, the phase one deal. Well, the phase one deal, uh, it's a very interesting situation because you've been hearing the largest order of corn in history, the largest order of soybeans, the largest order of beef. They've done more than they've ever done. So you're going to have to figure that one out with where I'm coming from. I could have, because they see my attitude. My attitude toward China is not friendly, but they have uh, gone into orders that are extremely large, extremely large, and our farmers are very happy. But with what they did with respect to the pandemic, the the uh, the plague that came in from China, uh, it just is a different feeling. It was an incredible deal, but I have a very different feeling. But they are giving they are giving the Midwest our farmers among the largest orders they've ever seen. Uh, somebody told me today, Bob Lighthouse, that it's about 40 percent of the of what they're selling now is uh, going to China. So maybe they're trying to make me uh, change my mind a little bit because you know my attitude on China, and it's not it hasn't been very good. Well, we're not talking to them. No, we're talking to the companies. In theory, it's a company, but it's a company within China. That means China. And uh, the deal will have to be substantially beneficial to the United States, and we need total security. Okay? Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President. Yes, uh, Mr. President, can you uh, say whether you yourself think that annexation should be off the table for Israel? And if so, have you communicated that to the No, not off the table. No, it's something they've discussed. But uh, Israel has agreed not to do that. I mean, more than just off the table. They've agreed not to do it. And I think that was very important. And I think it was a great concession by Israel. And I think it was a very smart concession by Israel. But, uh, David, do you have anything further to add on? Prime Minister was, was pretty clear today at his own press conference that he considers this to be a temporary suspension and that the deal would still be open to him at some point in the future. I'm asking what you think he should do. Should well, he right now, all I can say, it's off the table. So I can't talk about sometime into the future. That's a big statement. But right now, it's off the table. Is that a correct statement, Mr. Ambassador? Yes. The word suspend was chosen carefully by all the parties. Suspend, by definition, uh, look it up. That means temporary halt. Uh, it's off the table now, but it's not off the table permanently. Go ahead. Mr. President, thank you so much. Just to follow some of the questions that Caitlin was asking, you said you do want an accurate vote. Would That's right. Would you direct the Postmaster General to reverse some of the policy changes that have no, occurred not there in order to prevent delays? No, I wouldn't do that at all. No, I want the post office to run properly, but which makes sense. They would need a lot more money if they're going to be taking in tens of millions of ballots that just come out of the sky from nowhere. And so they need additional financial help. It's a part of the bill that the Democrats don't want to make because they want a trillion, much bigger part of the bill. They want a trillion dollars to go to uh, states that are run by governors who happen to be Democrats who have not done a good job for many, many years. And those are states that owe a lot of money and need a lot of money. And they're talking about $1 trillion. So the post office and the Three and a half billion dollars for the votes themselves, which sounds like a lot of money they're looking for. Three and a half billion dollars. Think of that. Three and a half billion dollars to have mail-in ballots. Uh, again, absentee good, universal mail-in, very bad. Uh, please. Just taking a step back, one quick follow-up. Given that the negotiations are still ongoing about whether to get more money to the Postal Service, why not put 
more resources and more money yourself. Find a way to do that to make sure there isn't. Well, they can do it very easily. All they have to do is make a deal. If they make a deal, the postal service is taken care of. The money they need for the mail-in ballots would be taken care of. If we agree to it, that doesn't mean we're going to agree to it. But all they have to do is make a deal. But again, more important to them is not that. That's a lot of money, but it's small time compared to the other. What they want to do, and very, very, very strongly what they want to do, is bail out cities that are run by Democrats and have been for many years. And these cities and states have done very badly, and they desperately need money for that. And we're open to something, but we're not open to the kind of money that they need. Go ahead, please. Mr. President, very quickly, my question is Just one second, please. What are you doing as president to make sure there is a free and fair election? That there was? What are you doing as president to make sure there is a free and fair election? So everyone talks about Russia, Russia, Russia. They talk about China, China. They talk about all of these different countries that come in and run our elections, which is false. But what they do, what they don't talk about are things like very loose mail-in ballots, universal in nature, that, frankly, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, all of these countries that we are reading about, hearing about, and in some cases they're writing about intelligence-wise, these countries can grab those ballots or print forgeries of those ballots, and they would go out and they would have a field day. This is the easiest way for — the mail-in ballots is the easiest way for a country like a China or a Russia or a North Korea or Iran. I hear Iran, too. You know, that was part of the report. Uh, this would be very easy for them. This is much easier than — well, we have been very strong. Now, if you remember, President Obama was informed about Russia by the FBI in September. The election was in November. President Obama decided to do absolutely nothing about it. People don't mention that very much anymore. That's a lost fact. But he was informed very powerfully that they're going to do, and President Obama did nothing. We have done a lot, and we've really shored it up. But what people can never prepare for are millions and millions of mail-in ballots, because they can be forged, they can be captured, they can be taken. No? Well, that's a very hard thing to do. We have to make sure that we can do that. Please. So, uh, Mr. President, after three and a half years, do you regret at all all the lying you've done to the American people? On all everything. the what? All the lying, all the dishonesties. That who has done? You have done. Uh, Tens of thousands. Yeah, go ahead, please. Please. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I wanted to ask about the payroll tax. Go ahead. Uh, cut. One, uh, is it going to be optional or mandatory for employers um, to defer and not collect the payroll tax? So we're, and so, and, and if I have a follow-up on The that. payroll tax is very important and a very big uh, benefit to people, as you know, to companies, because we want the companies to be strong, but now directly to people. And it's a very big number, and we're taking care of it, and we — this will go directly to the people, the workers within the company. It's a payroll tax. It's called a payroll tax cut. We're cutting the payroll tax, and it's a very large number, and that will go directly to the workers of the company. But well, well, if employers collect that, that through FICA, will that be — are they going to be required not to collect that money? The, you mean later on? You mean later on at a later date? Right now, date? so September 1, when I get my paycheck, will, the will employers, it be up to my The employers will collect it and give it, most likely. The employers will collect it and give it, okay? Please go ahead. I have two questions. The first one on domestic politics. There are claims. Can't can't understand the word. There are claims circulating in social media that Kamala Harris is not eligible to be to run for vice president because she was an anchor baby. I quote. Do you or can you definitively say whether or not Kamala Harris is eligible legal meets the legal requirements to run as vice president? So I just heard that. I heard it today that she doesn't meet the requirements. Uh, and by the way, the lawyer that wrote that piece is a very highly qualified, very talented lawyer. I have no idea if that's right. I would have thought — I would have assumed the Democrats would have checked that out before she gets chosen to run for vice president. But that's a very serious — you're saying that — they're saying that she doesn't qualify because she wasn't born in this country. No, she was born in this country, but her parents did not uh, 
The claims say that her parents did not receive their permanent residence at that yeah. time. Yeah, I don't know about it. I just heard about it. I'll take a look. Uh, back in the back. Mr. President, a follow-up on UNGA. Ambassador Kelly Craft recently said that you, or she is hoping that you might be able to deliver the speech in front of the UN General Assembly in person, even though other leaders will be sending in their video recordings. Can you confirm that? Yeah, I'm thinking about going directly to the UN to do the speech. A lot of people will not, because of COVID, will not be able to be there, uh, as you know. But I'm thinking, I think it's uh, appropriate. If we can do it, I'll do it directly. And uh, again, this will not be like in the past, because some countries won't be able to escape the problems they're having. You know, countries are having a tremendous problem with the China virus. So we'll see what happens. But uh, I would prefer doing it. I can do it the other way. I can do it uh, viral, as they say. I can do it in that form. But I'd rather be at the United Nations, deliver it. I think it, I think it better represents the country. Also, I feel sort of a, at least a semi-obligation as the President of the United States to be at the United Nations to deliver what will be an important speech. Would you still do it if the room is empty? Well, the room won't be empty. Uh, the room will have uh, different people there and representatives of countries. But I can understand how it's, you know, it's very difficult for countries to be there. They won't be there only for that reason. They'd love to be there. I've already had people call, in fact, say a couple of them, I'd love to be there. If you want, I'll be there. I said, don't be there. You don't have to be there. Uh, no, the room would be, uh, I think the room will not be, although there may be a spacing requirement like you have in this room. This room was always packed. This room would be packed again if we had the seats open, but you have a spacing requirement. So I understand that the United Nations, they may have that too. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a question on the peace deal, but if you don't mind, could I defer my question to Imam Khan from Epic Times? Sure. Yes. Please. Thank you, Mr. Please. Um, Thank you. I would like to ask your um, opinion about the, what recently happened in Hong Kong, recent attack on uh, press freedom in Hong Kong, and Jimmy uh, Lai uh, was arrested. His newsroom uh, was raided. Uh, well, how will the U.S. respond to this? Well, I think it's a terrible thing, but one thing that we have done, you know, we gave tremendous incentives to Hong Kong because of freedom. We want freedom. and. We were giving tremendous economic incentives to Hong Kong, and we have now withdrawn all of those incentives. And it will be impossible for Hong Kong to compete with the United States with respect to that. It just won't be, because we've taken all of the incentives away. If you look at China with the World Trade Organization as an example, they're getting tremendous because they're considered a developing nation, which is ridiculous. Why should they be a developing nation, but we're not? And they get tremendous incentives. We have, by the way, uh, told them it's unacceptable, and we've been we've been doing that for a long time. They understand exactly how we feel, and big changes are being made. But with respect to Hong Kong, they get tremendous financial incentives so that they could do business and compete in the world. We've now withdrawn all of those incentives. It's going to be very hard for Hong Kong to compete. And I will tell you that uh, the United States and I say this from any standpoint you want to hear it, we'll end up making a lot more money because of it. Because we lost a lot of business to Hong Kong. We made it very convenient for people to go there, for companies to go there. We've withdrawn all of that. And the United States will be a big beneficiary from an economic standpoint. But I hate to see what happened to Hong Kong because freedom is a great thing. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.